We come now to the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. The name means the Lord's messenger, and he was the last Old Testament writing prophet in Israel. Jewish tradition says that he was a member of the great synagogue. However, we know nothing definite about him apart from his book. The book was written somewhere between 440 and 420 B.C., and it addressed the generation that Ezra and Nehemiah spoke to. Malachi was a severe writer, and his mission was to call the post-exilic Jews back to their covenantal relationship with God. Covenant blessing required covenant faithfulness, and obedience to the law was rewarded with blessing in the land of promise. Disobedience, on the other hand, brought a curse on the people. This covenant regulated Israel's relationship with God throughout the Old Dispensation. See Deuteronomy 28. Now, at the time of Malachi, the Jews had fallen into great sin, and both the priests and the people were violating the stipulations of the Mosaic Law regarding sacrifices, tithes, and offerings. Also, the people's hope in God's covenant promises had dimmed, as evidenced by their intermarriage with pagans, chapter 2, verses 11 through 15, divorces, and social injustice, chapter 3, verse 5. The sins dealt with in this book are the same as those in Nehemiah, and Malachi rebuked and condemned these abuses, forcefully indicting the people and calling them to repentance. They were simply going through the religious rituals with no true heart transformation, and that led to widespread unfaithfulness. Malachi pointed to God's past, present, and future dealings with Israel in order to renew their perspective, reestablish their hope, and motivate them to proper covenant faithfulness. Let me also say that in reading this book, one cannot fail to see the everlasting love that God had for his people. Beginning with the second verse of the first chapter, and the Lord repeatedly referred to his covenant with Israel. See chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, verse 8, 10, 14, and chapter 3, verse 1. So Malachi's prophecy is in the form of a dispute, employing the question and answer method. And the Lord's accusations against his people were frequently met by cynical questions from the people. See chapter 1, verse 2, 6, and 7, chapter 2, verse 17, and chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, and verse 13. Finally, let me address two very important issues. In chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, it speaks about robbing God in tithes and offerings. And incredibly, many in the church have used these scriptures to impose a tithe system on their congregation. These verses were directed at the Jews who were under the law of Moses, and the tithe was required by God to support the Levites, who were chosen by him to minister exclusively in the temple. No secular work was to be done by them, so the Jews were to support them by bringing a tenth of everything to the temple. See Leviticus chapter 27, verses 30 through 32, Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22, verses 28 and 29, and chapter 26, verse 12. During the time of Malachi, the Jews were failing to support the Levites, so God withheld his blessings from them. The tithe was never given to the church, and nowhere in the New Testament are we commanded to give a tenth of what we make. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7 is the model for New Testament believers, and we are to give, not grudgingly or out of necessity, but from a cheerful heart. This is a classic case of leaders and lay people who have failed to rightly divide the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15 And many struggling saints have been put into economic slavery by greedy hirelings who have deliberately and willingly perverted these scriptures. The church of Jesus Christ is not under law, but under grace. Next, the interpretation of chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. The Sending of Elijah Many have tried to link these two verses with chapter 3, verse 1, 
which speaks of a messenger who prepares the way for the Lord's coming. However, Matthew chapter 11 verses 7 through 10 specifically states that John the Baptist was the messenger who prepared the way for the Lord. He was not the fulfillment of the prophecy about Elijah in chapter 4 verses 5 and 6. In short, he would minister in the spirit and power of Elijah, Luke chapter 1 verse 17. And he admitted that he prepared the way for the Lord, Matthew chapter 3 verse 3. But he denied he was Elijah, John chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. Now, in Matthew chapter 17, verse 11, our Lord, speaking apparently after John's death, affirmed that Elijah truly shall first come and restore all things. This future expectation indicates that Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6 was not fulfilled in the ministry of John the Baptist. Israel did not accept John the Baptist as the Elijah-like restorer of all things. So another Elijah-like forerunner is yet to come before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And as I have stated many times before, the term, Day of the Lord, is a technical term designating the seven-year tribulation period before our Lord's return. So, though John did not fulfill Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, Elijah was a type of John in that there is a great deal of similarity between Elijah in chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, and the messenger, John the Baptist, in chapter 3, verse 1. And when we go to Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 through 13, one of the two witnesses during the seven year tribulation period will have an Elijah like ministry. Many believe that it will be the Elijah from the Old Testament, because he never died. He was taken up into heaven in a whirlwind. See 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11. And he also appeared with Moses on the mountain when our Lord was transfigured before Peter, James, and John. See Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 13. So Malachi records Jehovah's last pleading with his people in the Old Testament period. After this, the prophetic voice will be silent for four centuries until the coming of John the Baptist. So with that, here's the outline. In chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, we see a reminder of God's love for Israel. In verses 6 through 14, sacrilege by the priests. These wicked priests were offering the worst of the animals to God blind, lame, sick, stolen, etc. This was in direct opposition to what God had prescribed in the law of Moses. See Leviticus chapter 22, verses 17 through 33. God demanded animals that were without blemish, because they all pointed to his Son, who would be the unblemished Lamb of God. See John 1, verse 29. This section showed the priest's contempt for God's sacrifices. God was angry, and he made clear that he would not accept their wicked and profane offerings. In chapter 2, verses 1 through 9, we see a warning to the priests. They are warned of dreadful judgment if they do not repent and change their ways. God had made them contemptible and base before all the people. In verses 10 through 16, we see divorce and mixed marriages. The men of Judah had divorced their Jewish wives and had married pagan and idolatrous women. In committing such an evil sin, they were destroying their national solidarity. They would be cut off. In verse 16, God is crystal clear. He hates divorce, and the people should take heed to their spirit and not behave treacherously. In verse 17, we see a denial of God's holiness and justice. In chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, we see a warning by God and Messiah coming in judgment. In verse 7, God charges the people with disobedience. In verses 8 through 12, they robbed God of tithes and offerings. In verses 13 through 15, the people complain harshly against God.
and in verses 16 through 18, we see a book of remembrance and the restoration of the faithful remnant. As in every age, there has always been a remnant of faithful Jews who truly love Jehovah. They will be spared and blessed, and acknowledged as God's own possession, being made into his jewels. And finally in chapter 4, we see the judgment of the wicked in verse 1. The coming of the Messiah to the remnant, verses 2 and 3. And a closing exhortation to obedience, with the promise of the coming of Elijah the prophet, verses 4 through 6. So the Old Testament ends with the promise of a curse, if there was not a repentant remnant. And in their synagogues, Jews repeat verse 5 after verse 6, so the book will not end with a curse. However, this attempt to soften the message does not alter the grim reality. So, when God delivered his final message through Malachi, he paused in his communications through man for nearly 400 years. A deafening silence in divine revelation resulted until the angel Gabriel appeared to the Virgin Mary and informed her that she would be God's chosen vessel to give birth to the Messiah. The hundreds of prophecies written by the prophets concerning our Lord's first advent would all be literally fulfilled, and our Lord would come to a people who were just as obstinate and rebellious as the people in Malachi's day. Sadly, when the Messiah of Israel appeared to his people, they did not receive him or delight in him, but crucified him. As John chapter 1 verse 11 says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. This concludes our study in the Old Testament, and I pray that it has brought you to a greater understanding and appreciation of the Word of God. Next up, the unblemished Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, is revealed to us in the New Testament Gospel of Matthew. Matthew.